Hey everyone, welcome to Handing the Shame Back, a show dedicated to survivors of sexual abuse. We're everywhere across the world, there's many, many millions, billions of us, and this is a safe place for you to come and land, tell your story, or just visit now and then and look at the amazing survivors who do tell theirs. The reason for the show is to offer support and resource for those like-minded souls out there who maybe haven't been able to talk as yet about their story um, or just feel they'd like to feel part of a survivor family. So my name's Gloria Masters, I'm your host and this comes to you every week. Um, as with every show, please be aware that if you feel at all triggered, stop watching. Don't put yourself through it. Go to the show notes below and you'll be guided to some resourcing support. In the meantime, another fantastic guest. But this time, this time, she's only across the ditch in Australia. I'm so excited. I don't get to interview many amazing survivors from Australia. Uh, her name's Christy McVie. She's a speaker, she's an author, she's an ex-child sexual abuse detective and specialist child interviewer. So man, have we got some stuff to talk about. Welcome to the show, Christy. Thank you so much. G'day, mate. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't have it. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't heard that one many times in my life, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can say whatever you like to me. Uh, <laughs> Well, no. it is always great. It's <laughs> always great to con connect with people, you know, in our uh, side of the hemisphere. So, yeah, it, it's nice to be on the show and to finally be chatting about this. 100%. So, viewers, for those that don't know, um, I'm always seeing Christy posting on Instagram and she's always seeing me and we're always liking. And you know, so, <laughs> I think about the same time we thought, oh, for God's sake, let's just reach out and connect. And yeah, and pretty here, much. Here we have the wonderful Christy. So, Christy, uh, in your own words, in your own time, what's your story? Yeah. So, basically, um, I didn't actually remember my child sexual abuse until recently. And it's interesting because I went into, I became a police officer and went in to become a child sexual abuse detective. And uh, and so I've had this long uh, history of knowing, uh, you know, helping others and, and helping them deal with their trauma and stuff. And then really only just in the last uh, couple of years remembered that uh, I had an experience when I was a young child that, you know, was ch child sexual abuse. Um, and it's only, and I don't actually remember it. I just remember that I told someone and, uh, and luckily for me, um, and I'll get into the story, you know, I told my grandmother who then told my dad and my parents had separated and, and I was living with my mom and her, her new boyfriend. And, and when my grandmother told my dad, um, he came and picked us up and we we didn't go back so I was in a very lucky situation because I'm an 80s baby um and we didn't usually you know from experience and from listening to many survivors myself we didn't actually have those kind of supportive networks a lot of us so I was very lucky and my dad was very protective so uh you know it's only recently I've actually told my mum um about it yeah, I, it came about because my own, my a half sibling had disclosed her sexual abuse and I said, well, actually, this happened to me as well. So, you know, um, it, it's interesting to me now when I think about it, and I probably haven't processed it, processed it properly, but I, it's interesting to me now that I went to the, the lengths of becoming a, a police officer and a detective and specialist child interviewer and I um, and now now starting to realize just how much that actually maybe that was part of the reason why I did all of that. I would say without a shadow of a doubt <laughs> and uh, welcome beautiful survivors great to see you here. You know Christy without a shadow of a doubt we are we are always driven to to that which makes sense to us so on some quite deep mm -hmm. you working 
with child abuse survivors and you actually interviewing, taking that specialist interviewing skill to another level. No one could have perhaps been better at it than you mm. uh, because of your own experience. So isn't it interesting that although you didn't have conscious recall till quite a bit later, subconsciously you were fully aware yeah and it's interesting because I was always very driven towards protecting children mm. um even before I became a police officer so if I ever saw something that was uncomfortable or uh you know and unfortunately even though I my dad was very protective he was also dealing with depression and I had a stepmom who was quite abusive um psychologically emotionally um I you know physical abuse as was the as was the way parents parented back then. Um, and so there was a lot of psychological abuse uh, that has probably had more of an impact than the child abuse, the, the, you know, the child sexual abuse. And I was always really driven to protect kids. And it wasn't until I had my own daughter at 27 and that sort of triggered that real mama bear, really protective part of my psyche, I would say, that I was like, how do I protect my, not only my own daughter, how do I help? And I wouldn't go and recommend becoming a police officer to everyone. <laughs> you know, that was the extreme, but it was something that I felt driven to do. And I'd never had that inkling or that drive to do that previous to then. Um, in actual fact, sometimes I still go, what the hell was I thinking when I uh, signed up and decided to try and become a police officer? Because I'm five foot one everyone thought I was joking. And uh, when I told them, they all laughed at me and said, yeah, whatever, Christy. And then of course that spurred me on even more um, because no one tells me I can't do anything. So, you know, I, I became that police officer. And then when I was a police officer, I was like, how do I help more? It wasn't until I started interviewing kids that I was like, this is what I'm meant to be doing. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And just, you know, a few threads to pick up on would be great for, for me sure. and for our audience. So just thinking, you know, your dad, God, don't we love that man? Thank you, dad. He came and got you as soon as he found it and you never went back. So my, my guess I'm just trying to uh, type a thread here. What was the story then with your mother? Were you just not able to see her again? Yeah, it's a really interesting story, actually. It, so my parents, my mum was actually 20-something years younger than my dad. Um, he was a much older dad, like he was 43 when I was born, without going into the whole, you know, um, and because I would, you know, if I saw that kind of relationship now, I'd be like, oh, anyway, we won't go there. But um, my no, dad's no judging. No, like we can't judge. My mum was a wild child, so she would have been leading that freaking thing all the way um in fact she admits to that now but um so my mum when she was she was a much younger a parent and she wasn't coping she didn't cope with kids and she didn't really want to be a parent and so her and my dad broke up she got a new boyfriend she went off partying and and there was neglect involved in that relationship as well my mum was neglecting her parenting duties um you know there was one story and it's in my I don't think I put it in my book, but there's a story where uh, my mum had gone off to work. She worked in the mines. We actually grew up, we, I was born in Kalgoorlie. We lived in a mining town and um, she went off to work. We left us with her boyfriend overnight and he went out and left me at six with my four-year-old brother. And I woke up in the morning and um, there was no adults around and I had to feed my brother who was crying and, you know, things, the, those are the types of memories I remember. And um, so there was a bit of neglect there. Um, my mum, even now, you know, she's in her 60s. She's like, I was a terrible parent and I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful your dad took you because he, he stepped up when I couldn't. And so being in the 80s, when we were we didn't have mobile phones or the internet or anything like that and my families have always been my dad was very transient he followed work everywhere I mean I don't know about you guys over the ditch but we had like the recession there was no work around it was really hard so my dad was following wherever and he's not a skilled labor he he's a truck driver who wasn't skilled in um, any type of job so he just took whatever work he could get and so I, I traveled the whole of Western Australia in like a year and a half trying to find like a stable home until we 
we settled in Port Hedland, which is in the Pilbara of Western Australia. And when we settled there, we kind of had a more of a stable home life and um, we weren't living in a caravan anymore and, and things like that. So, you know, those first few years when they separated were rough, but as a child, you don't know any better as long as you have, you know, the necessities of life and, and someone to love you. But unfortunately, that sort of all all shifted when my stepmom came in to the fold and, you know, she did her best, but we weren't her kids and, and she had her own way of parenting and my dad sort of didn't didn't take responsibility for that. He was like, that's, you know, old school thinking, that's a women, woman's job. He even admits that now. He's like, I probably could have done better if I had of, you know. And we've had lots of conversations. I, you know, the beauty of really di diving deep into what's happened, um, you know, in, when I wrote my book and I had to write about myself and I had to look into um, what had happened to me as a child and what was my key drivers um, I was able to unpack a lot and um, have have very delicate conversations with my dad and my mum about why all of this happened because I had no contact with my mum for years and um, and even when I did have contact I was very angry at her I don't know I'm sure some survivors can relate you know when a parent sort of lets you down so much as a child you you can be I was very angry at her because I thought she wasn't doing her, the right thing for me at the time. Um, my brother, who is a couple of years younger, he didn't have the same reactions or or feelings. He was a bit different. And now looking back, I'm so grateful that I can have these conversations with my parents because at 15 I was kicked out of home. So, again, you know, a uh, lot of abandonment. It wasn't until my daughter came along that I had to look myself in the face and like go, okay, what's underneath here? Because a lot of this stuff bubbles underneath, underneath, and it's not until you have your own children then your traumas start like basically jacking the boxing yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, and the, and it's a really interesting point you raise, and and just to to just look at another thread that you'd raised as well. You know, I always think that we're um, neglect um, and abandonment find a home, abuse will, will thrive. So interestingly for you, and luckily for you, you were taken out. Were, were you six years old when your dad came and got you? Were you a bit old? It more, I just not long after seven, I think. So yeah. I was six, seven years old. And it's interesting when my daughter was six or seven years old, I had a bit of a, like I actually got depression. Yeah. Um you know, and so I was dealing with depression while she was around six and I was being medicated and I was really angry at the world and, and I was a police officer at that stage and I felt like I didn't fit into the, it, there's so many ways this I could explain, but, you know, I didn't fit the policing mould because no. I was too I was too empathetic and I was too compassionate and I had, and they wanted me to harden up too much and I was, you know, I couldn't really, and it didn't fit me. Um, being that way but when I tried to I got depressed yeah. so yeah interesting isn't it how it's always there under the surface as you say and then of course you become a a mum yourself at 27 hello there's some memories right there uh, and then of course your daughter becomes the age you were and, and for survivors what should we know this to be true it often doesn't surface in us until we have a child of the same sex at around the same age when the abuse had either begun or, or was at its worst. So yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. It's I think it's really useful for our our um survivors to know that, you know, the, there's always links. And as we look back and you now look back, Christy, and you must see, oh my gosh. Yeah. Of course I was drawn to that. Yeah. Of course yeah. That happened with mum. Or of course dad. Yeah. It did. I mean, mm. yeah, I, I guess, you know, I I have the um and I think being a police officer made me see so many people in so many different ways of living life and, and struggles that I can be a bit more compassionate towards my own family and my own parents. Uh, maybe it's just me, I don't know, but because I've had enough experience with seeing people go through trauma and struggles and and the imp impact it has on the rest of their lives yes. that I that I actually have a lot more compassion for yeah. for people who are going through that and especially and it took a while for me to actually go hey I, I need to 
you know, be compassionate towards them. They were only doing what they knew. Um, and at the end of the day, the only people that are responsible for any of their behaviours are the people who did something. And it's the same with my own parenting. Yep. A hundred percent. So where, where does the responsibility and the blame and the shame lie? It's actually with the abuser. It's not with your mum and it's not with your dad. They didn't abuse you. That's you know, right. um, and I'm talking sexual abuse here. Yes, yes. The um, you know, and that's why this show is called Handing the Shame Back, because the shame never belonged to us as survivors, it belongs to the person who perpetrated. So, Christy, there, there will have been a lot to unpack. And as you say, it didn't surface for you. How old were you when the memories um, came through? Oh, I, re I think around, honestly, probably about four or five years ago. Yeah. And it wasn't until I left the police. And, um, again, we're sort of skipping ahead. So I was in the police for 10 years. I was a, so I was a general duty police officer who went in to start interviewing children. So I was called in to interview children who had been abused, sexually abused. I was getting their evidence for court uh, and, you know, doing my best there. And then after about three years of doing that, I was like, I want to, I want to help, you know, lock these people up, you know, that, and I used to get really frustrated with handing the file over to the detectives and watching them go get the bad guy, kind of like if we want to call it that trope. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, I, I want to do that. So I went and uh, applied and became a um, a detective. And again, I was pretty early on in my career because I, was, I wasn't even a first class constable. So I hadn't even made four years when I got in to detective training. And but I was driven. And obviously being an older police officer, because I wasn't straight out of school, I was, you know, a mum, I had a lot of, um, you know, like experience behind me, I, it made it much more easier for me to do the job I was doing. And then when I got into the detective training, I was like, I want to be in the child abuse squad. And, and so I did time in the child abuse squad, as well as other general duties and, and investigating sexual assaults and stuff like that. But it wasn't until the end of my career, the last two years, that I was interviewing children, investigating child sexual abuse, arresting and charging child sex offenders. And then when they were released from prison, I would uh, I was managing child sex offenders when they got out of prison and they were on a on the child sex offender register. So that was the last two years of my career. And um and obviously, I wasn't looking after myself very well. I got fairly bad, um, fairly severe anxiety. And there was a lot of, you know, reasons for that. I got severe anxiety and then I didn't um, treat that because in the police, that's not something we do. You you just suck up and keep going. And um, that was the culture that I was I was in. And, and then when I didn't do anything about the anxiety, then PTSD sort of slapped me in the face. And in actual fact, my daughter was 12 and, and funnily enough, I have trauma at 12 years old when both my pets, my dad and my stepmom got sick and there was some trauma around their, them nearly dying and, um, and I was 12 years old. So my daughter was the same age I was when I had all of this trauma about losing my, the only parents I had and I was, a, I was a massive people pleaser and I tried to do everything and, and she said to me, Mum, I want you to leave the police. And right. it's, and so she asked me to leave. I was coming up to my 10-year, uh, you know, long service and 10-year anniversary, and so I resigned because she asked me to. And how was that for you? Hard. Yeah. <laughs> Hard because in 10 years it had become my whole identity. You know, I was, and it filled something inside of me that I didn't realise that I was missing, you know. I wanted to help others so desperately. Um, and it was always there. I had friends who, when they found out I was a police officer or a detective, when childhood friends who were like, ah, oh, I'm not surprised. And I was like, why? I didn't know I was going to be one. They're yeah. like, <laughs> you were, you were always the one in the middle fixing things or, t or saving people or rescuing people. Like you used to come charging across, across the quadrangle if there was a fight and ripping people apart. She was like, and I was like. <laughs> I don't remember any of that. <laughs> um, you blocked she, it all. Yeah, but she was like, no, I can totally see you, you know, you were always meant to do that. So it was kind of hard. And unfortunately, I, I'm sure survivors can relate. 
when you are high stress, high anxiety for such a long time, and then that anxiety stops or that that stressor goes away, you know, whether you're in domestic violence, abuse situation, or, you know, your life, you just give yourself a chance to actually stop, your body goes into absolute meltdown. And I went from so stressed that my brain was, my brain and body and my nervous system were so dysregulated that, um, you know, I was having panic attacks. I was, I was having, you know, PTSD flashes. I would find myself in the bathroom with the lights off crying in the corner. You know, there was six months there that I thought, I don't want to be here anymore. And um, it wasn't, again, I said before we actually started recording that it wasn't the actual job of talking to kids and survivors and, and hearing their stories because I actually took so much, um, I was so honoured to have been that person. It was the the impact of not having um, the support in the police and not having those people, you know, not being taking care of my mental health as much as I should have. Well, and it's interesting because I'm I I am hearing this and I'm also being transported straight back to the six year old. Everything you're describing then at that mm. point is exactly what you would have been experiencing as a six year old. Mm. Um, and I imagine panic attacks may have been felt different as a six year old, but um PTSD having to be hyper vigilant all the time yeah. uh feeling the responsibility in the weight of your brother so it's interesting it never really goes away but it can get built on and what we know about the human mind is it will always but always bring us the same situation until we manage to resolve it mm. interesting so Christy as we're um as we, we're going to go into part two shortly, but I guess I just wondered, as you're thinking about the um, the amazing, beautiful children you were so honoured to interview, um, could you just describe for us the impact on you of listening to what they were brave enough to share? Just in a couple of sentences is fine. Oh, that's a very, very interesting question. At, in part, it was very, um, like I said, it was. I was very honoured to be that person that sat with those children and heard their stories. You know, I interviewed children from three all the way up to 18 years old. Um, and, you know, some of these children are just so resilient and brave and I was so in awe of them and so, um, you know, but sitting across with them and, you're trained to not have any reactions. You're trained to not get upset in those situations when they're telling you the worst things that have ever happened to them. Mm. And, um, but I was, I was so lucky that I was able to connect with so many of those children. And, you know, after the interview where I had to sit and, and stay, stay very stone faced and very passive, I would, you know, tell them how brave they were and how amazing they were and that they were survivors and that I thought that they were the best, you know, amazing. And I was able to give them that um, that support afterwards and, you know, build those relationships. And I'm so grateful for that. So it, it was hard, but it was, like I said, I can't, it's an, it's an honour to be involved in that. A hundred percent. And we're going to leave it there. So stay right there, Christy. But wow audience how how lucky are we to have someone that not only went through this herself but equally was able to help beautiful young children and adolescents by listening to their story with love and compassion and empathy and isn't that what we as survivors always hope that someone has your back and someone believes you so as always beautiful ones I see you, I stand beside you, and I believe you.